So good morning. My name is Christos Siofilou. I come from Cyprus. I am one of the four partners of Tax Atelier. Tax Atelier is a tax boutique firm based in Cyprus, providing Cyprus and international tax advice. Today I will be presenting uh, mainly two, three topics. The first topic that I will be presenting is residency and how residency is challenged by countries. I will briefly mention BEPS and EU. Uh, in order to introduce my subject, I will not get in depth because my colleagues have already presented this topic and I'm sure that the next colleagues will also present BEPS and EU BEPS. Uh, and I will conclude on automatic exchange information, how does this change the world and Cyprus as well. So the first topic is BEPS and the EU initiatives. Um, what do we know about BEPS? Uh, BEPS is a huge project. It's a 15 steps project. Uh, mainly it covers almost everything in international tax. Uh, I like to make things simple. Uh, BEPS, uh, apart from being 15 steps, we can split them in three pillars. The first pillar is an initiative that countries, they need to address their domestic legislation, their tax code, in order to introduce and the avoidance rules. And why they need to do that? Because multinational companies, uh, because they are doing international business, it's very easy for them to find loopholes in different jurisdictions. So if there is coherent among states, it will be very difficult for them to get advantage of double deduction or double non-deduction. The second pillar, it will be uh, substance. So I need to have, um, okay. The second pillar is substance. Uh, what BEPS is proposing is proposing again and the avoidance legislation. However, this lies on treaty law. So first, every country in tax code, we have our tax code, our domestic legislation, and then the second pillar is treaty law. So the second proposal is to amend double tax treaties by introducing and the avoidance legislation on double tax treaties. And why you are doing that? Even if your domestic legislation does not code on the avoidance and the abuse provision, then you have treaty law to do that. The th third pillar, which is also extremely important, is not exactly about taxes, it's about transparency. The BEPS initiative are proposing exchange of information, but not on banking information. This is exchange information in terms of transfer pricing, country by country reporting, exchange of rulings, exchange of advanced pricing arrangement. Why they're doing this? Because they need the tax authorities around the world to know which company is transferring profits from one jurisdiction to another. So this is the BEPS project. And what does this has to do with uh, Cyprus and the whole world? Um, let me give a structure that what they are trying to do. So this is a typical structure that the OCD proposes. You can see that uh, we do have the resident state where the headquarters of the company is there, is doing business around the world. This is proper business, all multinational doing business around the world. They want to expand their activities. Usually there is the source state that the investment is located there, and usually what the multinational companies are doing, they interpose subsidiaries or special purpose vehicles in the middle for their issues. You will see that the, all the 15 steps are around the whole structure picture. So you will understand that the initiative of the BEPS initiative is not just to attack one location, it's to attack the whole structure. So this is a very important issue because nothing is left out. This is a huge initiative. Now, uh, I want to highlight something that we have the EU BEPS, and what is the relation of Cyprus on this? The relation of Cyprus is that Cyprus is a member of the EU since 2004. We apply all the tax directives in the EU, and what is the message of EU in terms of BEPS? Because the OECD works together with the EU prior announcing the BEPS 15 steps in October 2015. As soon as the BEPS project was released, the EU has released the ADA directive, which is mainly all these steps are the coherent. So mainly if you go back, all these steps here are in the ADA directive. However, you will notice that the EU is more aggressive than the BEPS project. That's why we have included exit taxes. 
So Cyprus, being a jurisdiction in the EU, we are not just implementing BEPS, we are implementing the EU BEPS. This is a point I would like to make, which is more aggressive than the BEPS project. What else the EU has done? It has introduced the Council Directive, the DAC Directive, which is mainly exchange of information on financial information, on country-by-country -country reporting, on exchange of rulings, and so on. So mainly the third pillar of BEPS, which is this one, in the EU, we are, have already applied these directives with the DAC Directive, which is mainly this one here. So, what is the outcome of this proposal is that structures now are challenged by all countries around the world in terms of automatic exchange information, in terms of transfer pricing, in terms of residency, and in terms of beneficial ownership provision. I will focus my presentation on beneficial ownership and residency, which is a, a common, um, it's, a, it's both on the avoidance issue in brackets, but they have common rules, and I want to explain what is the difference of this notion and why the structure are challenged through these two notions. So the first one is residency. Uh, what is residency? Let me give a background information on this. Um, various countries around the world use various uh, tax code issues in order to comply with their taxpayers, whether you are tax resident in that country or not. So a country may have the incorporation test, meaning that you are registered in that country. If you are a common law jurisdiction, usually you have the common, the management control test, or a very near uh, another definition. Or if you are a civil law jurisdiction, you have the company seat, the legal seat, and so forth. Various other countries, if they want to be uh, more tough and more string, they use the effective management control or a combination of these residency criteria. However, what does this mean in practice? It means that a company may be found to be dual resident. And what does this mean? You will be resident in two states. So, for example, if you have a Cyprus company that is effectively management control from Ukraine, it means that Ukraine has jurisdiction to tax on your profits, same as Cyprus, so both countries would like to tax you. And what happens? Uh, you need to go to the treaty. The treaty has a tiebreaker rule. What is the tiebreaker rule to solve the issue? It's Article 4, Paragraph 3, which is the same with the OECD, which effectively means that if you are a resident, the residency, it is assigned, the winning state will be where the place of effective management control is. What does this mean? Uh, the OECD has clarified this in the commentary that the effective management control can only be in one state, so this is the tiebreaker role. It cannot be in two states. And uh, it mainly means that it's effectively where the company is run, where is your day-to-day -day business, where are your managers, where are your employees, where you take the decisions. You cannot have two residency, but you can only have one. However, uh, the BEBS project look at this, they tried to make an the avoidance rules of that, and what they came up is that the effective management control is a perfect test, they don't want to change that. However, in order to deter taxpayers structuring their activities, being dual resident, they have changed it, so they changed the management control, and the test is that is by mutual agreement procedure. So the both countries, uh, they don't have a time breaker rule, what they will have is that they will sit together and they will discuss whether you are resident in the one country, Cyprus, or in the other country, in Ukraine. And if they decide that they, want, they don't want to assign residency in a country, they will say that you are dual resident and they will both tax you. So the tiebreaker rule now, it, it uses as a vice versa rule in order to make companies deterring their activities being dual resident. Now, I want to give an example of um, how residence is assigned. Now, effectively, what does this mean? In practice, let me give you an example to see whether if you are a dual resident, what happens. Let's assume that you have the, your head office in Cyprus. You have a company uh, that is a treasury company. It provides 
cash pooling in your group. It provides loans. So effectively you have, let's assume that you have interest income of a million, you have interest expense, so you have a gross profit of 90,000. These profits will be taxed in Cyprus. However, if you are resident in Ukraine as well, it will be treated as a tax resident in Ukraine, and they will tax these profits in Cyprus as well. So effectively, you will have the Cypriot tax, the Ukrainian tax, and if you are lucky, you will get relief. If you are not lucky, effectively, you will pay both. So the effect is not that huge. However, the issue is whether you pay dual tax. Now, the next question that arises is that, okay, uh, I don't want to be dual resident. What shall I do? What are the tax residency criteria that Cyprus follow? Unfortunately, in our tax code, we don't have a definition of what is management control. We don't have details of how residency is assigned. However, we are an EU jurisdiction. We follow the ACJ. We follow what the European Court of Justice says. So we are looking for cases. And the first case I would like to mention is a leading case, category swaps, leading case on substance, leading case not exactly on residency, because also the EU does not have a code on residency. However, um, this is a case where the United Kingdom has established two subsidiaries in Ireland to do treasury pooling um, for CFC reasons. The structure was challenged, so they have looked at the substance of the transaction, and the judge went through and said, if these companies here, they have wholly artificial arrangement, I disregard the structure. So the wholly artificial arrangement is the key word when you are placing substance. And what does this mean in practice? Um, I will have some residency criteria from this EU case and other EU case law, which effectively means that the first thing that the judges they look at is statutory substance. So the one million dollar question is how much substance? How much substance I need to place on my structure? So the first key you need to do is statutory substance. And what is statutory substance is that that company is established in that country. It makes its tax return. It pays taxes. It files accounts. So it's very easy for someone to go there and find it. So you fulfill all your statutory obligation in that country. The second and key uh, important issue that judges look at is genuine activities. So are your activities genuine? Are you doing proper business? Do these activities fit in your structure? So you have a company there is doing a business. Is this a normal business or is it a fake business? This is a sham transaction. So they go through and look at the genuine activities of the company. The third and fourth one is not actually a substance criteria. However, this is a red flag. So if you don't have a, a formal profit attribution based on economic reality, it doesn't mean that you are not resident there. What it means for judges is a red flag to go through and scrutinize the structure. The fourth one, which again is thin capitalization rules. We don't have thin capitalization rules in Cyprus. However, if a company is thinly capitalized, it means that something is going wrong there. Why the company is thinly capitalized? Why the debt to equity ratio is not normal? Who is injecting the money there with high risk? So you scrutinize the structure. The fourth and great importance is physical substance. You need to have physical substance. And what physical substance means? It means that you need to have premises, equipment, a rent agreement, a proper company. So if I come to Cyprus and I want to find your company, I want to give a call to your company, I want to come and see they have a conference, or have a meeting, I need to find you. So this is physical substance. However, this is very easy. What the judge went and looked at, and this is very important, is that you need to have the proper staff qualified for the economic activities that are being performed. What does this mean in practice? Going back to my previous example on the treasury company, let's assume that the board of directors consists of three uh, highly educated people. They need to be educated, not just educated, but they need to be educated for the economic activities of the company. So for instance, if the three directors are directors and they are PhD qualified on biochemistry, uh, they don't mean that they have the finance background to run the activities, assume the risk and rewards of the company and make decisions. They are probably qualified, but not for that business. 
I don't want to discuss any nominees, uh, those that are unqualified and they don't understand what is happening. I want to make sure that you have proper business watching on this specific role. Now, this is on substance. I want to discuss a slightly different notion, which is one of a great importance, is the beneficial of the income. A lot of people confuse this notion. I want to start by explaining what is this. Um, the beneficial of the income, I want to highlight the word income, because the majority of the people confuse this word with the beneficial owner of the company. It doesn't have to do anything with shareholders. It only has to do with the decision of the directors. We are discussing about the income. Now, this is a, a little bit of background information. Uh, it's a quite old treaty and the avoidance legislation. It's since 1977. Uh, you can find it in Articles 10, 11, and 12. Dividends, interest, and royalties, mainly passive income articles. Uh, you can also find it in the old EU directive that has to do with interest, dividends, and royalties. So the EU is in line with the OECD. Uh, and the primary goal is to and the abuse treaty shopping and provide, deny the treaty benefit. Now, let's see a case uh, that was a pure treaty shopping case. However, what is peculiar on this case is that the judge uh, ruled in favor of the taxpayer. What does this mean? Let me explain what happened in this case. We have uh, two companies, Sweden, Volvo, and Henleys. They want to invest in Canada, in Prevost. So this is a Prevost case. Um, if they invest directly from their home country, uh, Sweden will pay 15% withholding tax when the dividends will be paid out to Sweden. Similarly, the UK, they will pay 10% withholding tax, sorry, Canada will withhold 10% withholding tax when the dividends will be paid out to UK. However, uh, what, uh, the, what those companies did, they have interposed a Netherlands BV in the middle. Uh, so when the dividend was paid out from Canada to the Netherlands, the treaty with, reduced the withholding tax to five. And when the dividends were paid out from the Netherlands to the UK or Sweden, having the participation exemption, you don't pay any tax. So they have effectively reduced their tax base a uh, 100% or more. However, if we see the judge of the case, what the judge said is that because you are not a conduit, you are not a fiduciary company, you are doing proper business, it ruled in favor of the taxpayer and, and didn't raise the corporate veil of the company. Why he did that? He did that for two reasons. The judge went and looked the substance of the transaction. So he said, you are not a conduit, you are not a nominee, you are not a fiduciary provider, you are doing proper business. If I want to find you, I'm coming to your country, I can find you. However, the judge went one step forward and looked at the pass-through of the transaction. So he did go and see that whether in the memorandum of article of association of that company, is there any legislation that says that I need to pass through the dividends from the directors to the shareholders without their will? Is there any contractual obligation of doing that? The judge ruled no. So the dividends were properly declared under, according to the Dutch law. The shareholders approved the dividend. There was no obligation to pass through the dividends to the shareholders. So this was a proper company doing proper business. So if you want to conclude, who is the beneficial of the income? It will certainly be not a conduit, not a nominee, not a mere fiduciary or administration acting on behalf of someone else. This is a negative definition provided in the OECD. If you go to the commentary, you will find the definition. However, what is recently clarified by the OECD is that we have now a positive definition which says that the, the, UB, sorry, the beneficial of the income you need to have the, rule, the full right to use and enjoy the payment unconstrained by a contractual or a legal obligation to pass it on to another person. So what is the difference of residency and beneficial ownership provision in terms of substance? This is a, a million dollar question. It's a pass-through situation. So even if you have a company, not just in Cyprus, around the world, and you have full substance, uh, 100 employees, a huge building, 
everything in proper. However, if you have a back-to-back -back arrangement, either it will be a loan, either it will be a back-to-back -back loan, either it will be a back-to-back -back financing, or a contractual obligation to pass through the dividend, it means that you are not the beneficiary of the income. And you have to be careful drafting contracts, careful doing business, because this is an extra layer of the avoidance legislation above of substance. So mainly it overlaps substance. The judges, when they have beneficial of the income, they look both. And I want to make an example of why they look both. Uh, this is slides for completeness purposes. We had a case for dividends. However, the same rule applies for interest and royalties. However, let me give an example. This is the same example as we have done with residency. The issue with beneficial of the income is that you don't get the expenses. What the countries has challenged is the revenue, it is the income, and not the profits. So the difference is what? If there are one million interest expense in Ukraine, so assuming that you have a, fine, a treasury company in Cyprus providing loans in Ukraine, and you paid out a million of interest expense in Ukraine, so it will be interest income in Cyprus, you will challenge the whole million and not the 90,000. So you will get a 2% reduced withholding tax due to the treaty. The treaty will be denied, and you will need to pay 150,000. So it's obvious that the beneficiary of the income is more attractive to states to challenge than challenge substance because they want to tax your revenue and not your profits. What is the difference between revenue and profits? It's expenses. So they don't care about expenses. They want to uh, reduce the withholding tax, which always the withholding tax is on gross, not net. Now, I want to conclude my presentation uh, on automatic exchange information. Cyprus is an early adopter. We have already exchanged the first information now uh, one month ago. Briefly, because I don't have the time, uh, I want to make a point here. This is a huge initiative. The OECD has appointed mainly the G20 appointed the OECD to provide automatic exchange information, and the OECD has created the global forum to uh, effectively monitor the situation. Imagine that there are 147 members of the Global Forum, and the whole world consists of 195 countries. So almost all jurisdictions that have a sound banking system, they are included in the OECD, they are members of the Global Forum, and they are almost part of this initiative. And more of them are also joining. What is the status now of the automatic exchange information. Early adopters have already exchanged the information, so Cyprus is an early adopter. Mainly the early adopters are EU jurisdiction and e, uh, UK independencies and so forth. We have the late adopters, which they will exchange the financial information of this year, next year. Uh, we have some jurisdictions that are, they are also trying to join, which is also Ukraine. As my colleagues, they have already mentioned that Ukraine is joining. So we can see that this is a huge initiative and all the jurisdictions are following the exchange information. Briefly, what exchange information means, it means that uh, the financial institutions will report the information. What is a financial institution? It can be a bank, it can be a custodian, it can be a retail investment fund, it can be anything that provides financial services falling under financial institution. They need to report the accounts and who they will report, they will report individuals and entities. The definition of entities is a wide range. It can be a company, it can be a partnership, it can be a trust, it can be a foundation, it can be anything. Now, the issue is who they will report and what. For individuals, it's very easy. I am an individual, I'm a physical person, I have a bank account, I will report that. However, for entities, the financial institution will clarify whether this is an active or a passive. The difference of the two is that if you are an active NFE and a company, it means that you report the account holder. What does this mean in practice? Uh, AMBC Limited is classified as an active NFE. You report AMBC Limited accounts. 
if you are a passive NFE though, so MBC Limited is a passive NFE, you don't report only the account holder, which is MBC Limited, you also report the controlling persons, which is usually the UBOs. So you report both. So if you are a passive NFE, have in mind that not just the company will be reported, but also the shareholders will be reported. Um, what is active and what is passive? Uh, active is uh, doing trading and doing proper business, uh, so it will not be a company that has passive income mainly, interest, dividends, royalties, rental income, or capital gains tax. What is uh, passive uh, mainly is a definition that is whatever is not active. Just to make a structure to understand what's happening and a couple examples and I will conclude is that the first rule is that who is responsible is financial institution. So the banks are responsible to report the information, who they will report, they will send the information to the competent authority. Usually the competent authority are the tax authorities and the tax authorities will send automatically the information. So the financial institutions that, that they report, they need to identify whether their entities are active or passive and if you do that, then you will report. Let me give some example just to understand better what's happening. Let's assume that you have a Cyprus company. It's tax resident in Cyprus. It has a Greek tax resident shareholder and has a bank account in Cyprus. The Cyprus, the Cyprus tax authorities will not report the information because this company is an active non-financial entity. So if you are an active, you report the account holder. The account holder is a Cyprus tax resident company, so there is no need to report. However, in the same example, if the Cyprus company is found to be a passive non-financial entity, then you look through, you go to the controlling persons, you see that the controlling person is a Greek tax resident, that tax resident you report it to Greece. So this is the difference of active and passive. Let me show a triangular example, which makes things a little bit more complicated. Let's assume that uh, a, Greek, uh, a German tax resident company has a bank account in Cyprus, and the shareholder of that company is a Greek tax resident. So you have a Greek tax resident, has a German tax resident company having a bank account in Cyprus. If this company is inactive, you report the account holder, which is the company. So Cyprus tax authorities will report to the German tax authorities the account holder. In the same example, if the, Cyp if the German company is found to be a passive NFE, so you make the look through, the Cyprus tax authorities will report both and the German to the German tax authorities and to the Greek tax authorities. You go look through, you find the shareholder, and it's very easy for the, camp, for the banks to find the shareholder because they know who is the UBO, they have their KYC, they have their AML procedure. It's very easy for them prior opening the bank account to know who is the account holder and they will report both. So this is my presentation. Uh, hope you enjoyed my 25 minutes presentation, you find it useful. I don't know if we have time for questions. No. Okay. No. Thank you. Thanks a lot.